Hello, and welcome to Ask the History Buff, the podcast that informs and educates about Canadian history. Hopefully, you will also be inspired to research some aspect of Canadian history because you heard it on Ask the History Buff. Each week, we will explore the lives of influencers, events which they influenced, and the legacy, sorry, the legacy which we as Canadians have inherited because of the influencer or because of the events that they influenced. I'm Lynette, your curious Canadian history buff. I am not a degreed historian with letters behind my name, but I have researched more of our Canadian history than most people have. I am always discovering new, interesting information about Canadian history, which excites me. And that's why I call myself the Curious Canadian History Buff. I hope you will be encouraged to Google people's names and events surrounding them like I do to understand their impact on our society. So ask yourself the question, do I follow rabbit trails when I'm reading about past influencers in Canada by clicking on links and Googling people's names? And for Christian listeners, do I live like a Berean, which is searching out everything I hear and checking out the information myself? And if you are just too busy to search, then ask the history buff. Chances are I may have the answers. And if I don't, I will look for the answers and get back to you. Feel free to challenge any of my information anytime by sending in your questions to info at christianrootscanada.org. You may teach me something. You may teach me something I never thought about before. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and to like and share this podcast. Now, today's topic will be part two of J John Gray's Simcoe and the legacy that he left behind, because we are looking at Christian Legacies in Ontario. This episode, we will look at his political legacy. John Graves Simcoe became a politician when he was first elected to the British House of Commons for the Cornish Borough of Moors in 1790. So that's one year before he came to Upper Canada. His recorded contributions to the speeches in Britain's House of Commons, his contributions are really telling about where his heart was. Those contributions include a speech about the new Constitution of Quebec, because the Constitution Act was passed in 1791, and most likely a motion to abolish the slave trade. You knew from the last episode that he had attempted to start a, a military arm using free black slaves from Boston during the War of American Independence. That was thwarted. In 1791, Simcoe was appointed Lieutenant General of the new Loyalist Province of Upper Canada. At the same time that Sir Guy Carleton was appointed as 
the new lieutenant governor of Lower Canada and also the governor general of those two provinces. So they were colonies at the time. So he was the governor general for Upper and Lower Canada, but he was the lieutenant governor just for Lower Canada, which was Quebec. Simcoe was so zealous to inaugurate his new government that he spent 18 months in preparation for the position. His grand plan was to see rapid economic growth so that so to the end that he developed ambitious and what was categorized as unrealistically expensive plans. Remember from the last episode, he asked for 12 battalions of soldiers, rangers to build the roads and he only got two. So he had really ambitious plans. Remember what happened with the land grants? He thought that uh, giving large amounts to large grants to people who would build settlements um, would work and it didn't work. So he had ambitious plans for this new uh, colony of Upper Canada. Some of these plans included constitutional, religious, and educational development of his new province. He saw it as his new province. Even before he had he had seen the province, he envisioned making Upper Canada a model of England overseas. His first speech to the legislature at Newark, which is now Niagara on the Lake, was made in September 1792. Because of his participation in the American War of Independence, Simcoe had a special interest in seeing the continuation of British conservatism, of its institutions continuing, and its rule in North America. He had kept in touch with some of the loyalist exiles and was genuinely sympathetic towards them. He had very little success in persuading the imperial administration to support his ambitious plans. In that vein, constitutionally, he convinced the British administration to transfer the Department of Indian Affairs to the civil government in Upper Canada. In that way, remember that a lot of the Iroquois Confederacy helped with the War of American Independence, helped Britain, and many of them came to Upper Canada. People like Brandt and a lot of the Mohawk leaders came to settle in Southern Ontario. So he was really concerned about moving the, the Indian Affairs Ministry to Upper Canada, so where he had better control over the decisions that were going to be made for the natives who had helped in the war uh, against America in the War of American Independence. So he was, he was able to convince the British administration to transfer the Department of Indian Affairs to the civil government of Upper Canada, where he was really overseeing all of that. Well, he was not successful in having a separate commissariat, which is a store to supply the military with food and other supplies. He was not successful in securing that for Upper Canada. However, because he was sympathetic to the settlers in the terrible winter of 1795-1796, he requisitioned the military supplies normally used for civil works and, and rations. He, he ordered 
requisitioned military supplies for them. It was discontinued shortly thereafter. Now, educationally, during his short stay from of 1791 to 1796, he appealed for a grammar school in Kingston and a provincial university fed by the students of the grammar school. There was not enough support for public education at that time because it was not seen as an urgent need. In terms of religious matters, he made the argument that the church was important for reinforcing social and political conservatism. Social conservatives, political conservatives. As a result, good Anglican that he was, he supported the clergy reserves and the clergy reserves endowment for the Church of England. However, even though Simcoe was disappointed with the level of education and the social status of the members of the Legislative Assembly, remember the Legislative Assembly was the um, uh, election of the common people to the government, which is like the elections now for the House of Commons. So he was disappointed with the level of education and the social status of the members of the Legislative Assembly. They were generally on the same page with the same goals in mind. His main job was to establish a constitutional framework of civil government in the new province. Settlers were not particularly interested in details of setting up that system. Most of the legislation he brought before them in the first session was not particularly controversial and included the adoption of English civil law and trial by jury, which is a basic biblical reference, trial by, by um, being accused and judged by a jury of your peers. Um, so he, he, they adopted English Civil War in 1792. The adoption of standard weights and measures and the licensing of taverns. And you know, the, the standardization of weights and measures is also a biblical term where even Christ uh, enjoined his listeners to have equal weights and measures. There shall not be different weights and measures. So another uh, piece of legislation in the first uh, session of the Legislative Assembly included the acceptance of the need to provide jails for the four administrative districts. So there were four administrative districts in Upper Canada or Ontario. Two pieces of re legislation were rejected, one for land tax and the other for education. Two pieces of legislation were initiated by the assembly the legalization of marriages performed by magistrates and town elections. So you see what the issues that were at the grassroots level were get us how we want legal legalization of marriage. He conceded to the marriage issue with the caveat that if there were five Anglican clergymen in the district, with one of them 18 miles, one of them within 18 miles, the bill was null and void. That you can Google because I don't have all the details why that was so important. One area of compromise in May 
1793, now this is a year later, was settling for a gradual rather than immediate, than immediate abolition of slavery in the province. So he wanted in 1793 already, he wanted to see the abolition of slavery. But he compromised and agreed for its gradual as opposed to its immediate uh, as opposed to its immediate abolition. In 1794, the assembly accepted the formation of a superior court or a court of king's bench, as it was called. A bill of 1793 affirmed that the election of township officers can only happen under the control of justices of the peace who were appointed by the Lieutenant Governor, Simcoe, and remained the real power of local government. Dealing with the Legislative Council was more difficult. Remember the Legislative Council were the merchants and the um, people who had a vested interest in the country and they were appointed, they weren't elected just like the Senate is right now. So, but dealing with the Legislative Council was more difficult. He did not trust merchants and land speculators. There were less than 10 councillors with never all of them present together. So direct confrontation and defensiveness worked against him with a small group of people maybe less than seven that he had to interact with, and they were probably not always um, open to his ideas. So that was the legislative council that he was not excited to deal with. Special interest rivalry was palpable. In theory, he expected their independent judgment of his agenda, but in practice, he was disappointed that they did not just rubber stamp his projects and agendas. Remember, he was very ambitious and his ideas probably didn't jive very well with the merchants and the land grabbers. Areas where he had common ground with his two most outspoken critics who were Robert Hamilton of the Niagara region, Robert Hamilton, uh, he was the father of the other Hamilton who built, um, who moved away and lived in Hamilton, and the Hamilton is named after him. So uh, Robert Hamilton and Richard Cartwright, and they're interesting characters. If you could stop and look for their names, Google their names, they're interesting characters. So, uh, so though he had common ground with his two most outspoken critics who were Robert Hamilton and Richard Cartwright. And that was concerning Western commerce on the upper Great Lakes, which Hamilton really wanted to do and which he engaged in a lot. And Western Canada, Western commerce in the upper Great Lakes of Western Canada and municipal councils, which uh, Richard Cartwright endorsed and encouraged him on. John Graves Simcoe was inexperienced as an administrator and had not had years of political experience as master of manipulation and compromise. However, the assembly, the legislative assembly and the legislative council found him to be accessible. He was frank, he was reasonable, they found him warm and sympathetic and loyal to his subordinates. If only Simcoe's father were alive to see his son's accomplishments in the wilderness of Upper Canada, he would have seen the roads he mapped out and built for cities of the future, 
cities like Toronto, Kingston, Burlington, Hamilton, Niagara on the Lake. He would have seen the foundations of the parliamentary system of democracy he laid down and the accolades of those who knew him best. He lived out his father's maxim for his life. He pursued military training with a formal education. He was trained for civil as well as military appointments. He gave energetic devotion to any task or endeavor. He practiced devotion to duty. He lived and acted according to biblical standards of right and wrong. He was compassionate to the downtrodden. And you say that with, the, with him giving the settlers who were suffering in that terrible winter. He gave them military rations. And you hear the story of him seeking to abolish slavery. He was a compassionate, he was compassionate to the downtrodden. Add to that the moving of the Indian Affairs uh, Department to Upper Canada, where he could have control over it. John Grace Simcoe left Canada never to return. But the system of roads dictating settlements and not the other way around was responsible for the planned settlements of areas like Niagara on the Lake, London, Burlington, Hamilton, York, and eventually, Kingston. Upper Canada or Ontario and York, Toronto, have much for which to thank John Graves Simcoe. He had kept in touch with some of the loyalist exiles and was genuinely sympathetic towards them. And when he was in England, before he came here, he included a speech about the new constitution of Quebec. He was defending the constitution of Quebec, which was the province of Quebec before it was divvied up. And most likely an, a motion to abolish the slave trade. He gave us constitutional, religious, and educational development for his new province. He brought the Department of Indian Affairs home to Upper Canada. He was sympathetic to settlers in the terrible winter of 1795-1796. The church was important for reinforcing social and political conservatism. He instituted election of township officers that can only happen under the control of justices of the peace. His friends and his subordinates found him accessible, frank, reasonable. They found him warm, sympathetic, and loyal to subordinates. Friends, this is the legacy of John Graves Simcoe. And if you would like to know more about John Graves Simcoe, go to our website, www.christianrootscanada.org and click on biographies and you can read more about John Graves Simcoe there. And if you want to learn more about Canada's Christian Roots, well, you've come to the right place, www.christianrootscanada.org. So check out our website and you can also find our videos on YouTube and Rumble and our podcast on Spotify and Amazon Music. And we will see you in the next podcast. So bye for now. Uh, the next person that we will be dealing with is Joseph Brandt.
Have you ever wondered why Quebec is so different from the rest of Canada? Why is there a French presence in Canada? And where did they come from? If you have not delved into our history from France, I almost guarantee you that you didn't know that Canada was first colonized by persecuted Huguenots, the French Protestants. At first, a small group of them were given fur trading monopolies by King Henry IV. Then others came after Henry IV died. They fled from Cardinal Richelieu and his brutal French Catholic regime. And why did that happen? Let me introduce you to the French Connection. The French Connection is a story-based video history course linking our history to the marble frieze over, mounted over the left doorway of the House of Commons. It shows Francis I on the, on the left and Louis XIV on the right. These kings also bookend stories of the persecution of the Huguenots, which started under Francis I and continued until Louis XIV, except for under Henry IV. The course covers 200 years of history, uncovering the stories of the Huguenots who established the first colonies in the Atlantic provinces, Quebec, and Ontario. This program is the first of its kind. It's chronological, explicitly biblical, with video-based stories for all of the family. It traces God's providence in bringing different people together to write his story. In September 2024, we will be introducing our new additions to the course, the new student workbook, and the new answer key. The workbook contains questions, quizzes, projects, essays, extra readings, supplemental videos, a final test, and so much more. You will also get six modules, which breaks down into 26 video stories and lesson outlines, as well as an audio version and an ebook. There are also maps and charts and timelines and photos and other extra student-only resources. So here's the steal of the deal. Compared to other Canadian history courses, you get 26 video lessons, the audio version, so you can re-listen to the content anywhere, anytime, an ebook, the new student workbook, the new answer sheet, and for homeschooled high schoolers, the equivalence of one Canadian history credit. Here's an extra bonus. You don't have to purchase annual licenses for each student in the same household. It's a one-time purchase deal. You have permanent access for use by all students in the same household. And here's a great deal for you. Until September 6th, all listeners get a 10% off coupon because you listen to Ask the History Buff. Just use the code History Buff at checkout to get the entire course for only $270. I call that a steal of a deal.